I'm operating from Delhi. Operating. I'm headquarters, CSR yeah. headquarters. Okay. So although we have labs spread across the country. Is to welcome you to this webinar series, Cultures of Innovation, Past, Present, and Future: Stories from Switzerland and India. You have been numerous in registering for the series, which shows that you're probably choosing some of the right topics to address in our activities. In this series, uh, as we said, we'll explore the past, present, and future of the cultures of innovation with leading experts and policymakers, and in the, also explore the success of transferring results of academic research to industry. The first webinar last week provided a historical perspective on the adoption of technology in China, India, and Switzerland. Topics of global importance, be it uh, efficiency and innovation, the policy underpinnings necessary to achieve them, the bottom-up approach, and the, emph the emphasis on professional training and affordability were addressed. In case you were not... Uh, where is it not moving? No, I'm supposed to be able to move the slide. Uh, just a minute. Ah, sorry, we'll get back there. Sorry, I'm having some technical problems, but I'll get back to you. Uh, we'll be back there very soon. Anyway, let's uh, forget. Um, so in case you are not able to attend the webinars, you, you, uh, they have been recorded and we will share the, we will share the URL, uh, URL with you. Uh, today's webinar will look at the current science, technology, and innovation policies in India, Singapore, and Switzerland, and the role that they play in creating and nurturing innovation ecosystems. The third webinar uh, next Tuesday will examine whether India, Japan, and Switzerland have been successful in transferring the results of uh, fundamental research towards industry and the lessons that have been learned to make them more efficient. We have an impressive list of speakers for all webinars, and I hope you will join us for the next one as well. After opening statements, we will have a moderated discussions, moderated discussion with the speakers, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Please type your questions if you have any in the question box and state if you wish them to be addressed to a particular speaker. We will try and take as many questions as we can. Let me say a few words about, um, about the network which is organizing this series. Swissnex is the global, um, Swiss global network charged with forging ties in education, research, and innovation with the mission to promote the international outreach of Swiss stakeholders and support them, activity, support them actively in the international exchange of knowledge, ideas, and talent. The five Swissnex sites, Boston, San Francisco, Shanghai, Bangalore, and Rio de Janeiro, and their satellites, together with around 20 science counselors in Swiss embassies, helped to promote Switzerland's position as a global innovation hub. The network celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. So, and Swissnex India, the organization that I work for, turned, text, turned 10 last week. So, happy birthday. This session is um, this session is brought to you by the embassies of Switzerland and uh, uh, in China, India, Japan, and Singapore, and the Swiss Nexus in China and India, with the su support of the Swiss Public Diplomacy Initiative in India, Swissit. I take this opportunity to thank the sponsors of Swissit, um, and I now call upon our first speaker, Dr. Ramaswamy Bansal, Chief Scientist and Head, International Science and Technology Affairs Directorate, Council of Scientific Indus and Industrial Research, India. Dr. Bansal, you have seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Infinil, and thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Once again, good morning, good afternoon to all the participants and to my fellow panelists. Uh, like other countries, India has also taken up, instituted several policies. To, uh, to be specific, we have had four policies so far on science and technology and innovation. 
Uh, the first one focused on science. Uh, this was brought in in 1958. The second policy document was that focused on technology aspects uh, came out in 1983. The third policy was brought in in 2003, where both science and technology were together addressed. And it's only in the fourth policy, which was instituted in 2013, uh, the innovation component was added and was discussed for the first time. Now, accent in each of these policy documents had been different based on the circumstances and needs of the country at that time. Uh, for example, if I quote uh, the, some of the outcomes of the past policies, we can say that the first policies have uh, focused mainly on building of the talent pool, skill, and the infrastructure. And one of the prime focus have, from the beginning had been on enhancing the R&D spending. But slowly we move towards innovation uh, sphere. The policies consistently supported development of highly skilled s and human resource base and infrastructure, as I just mentioned. As a result, India today has a massive STI ecosystem. Now, in the current time, the prevailing policy, the operational policy is the one which was set up in 2013. It's called Science, Technology and Innovation Policy. Uh, the main, um, I mean, why it was taken up, the motivating factors were that India acknowledged that to stay globally competitive, transition to a knowledge-based economy is necessary. Also, that innovation is the key to building ST led innovation ecosystem. Uh, accordingly, 2010 to 2020, this 10 year period, the decade was announced as the decade of innovation. And it was aimed to position India among the top five global scientific powers. So we still aim to do that, but work is going on uh, in this direction. We are in the right direction. Uh, would like to uh, acquaint you with the salient features of uh, the, the current policy, which is ongoing. Uh, one of the main agenda here is to attract private sector uh, into R&D, attract the funding and also collaborations with them and link STI, the science, technology and innovation to socio-economic priorities. Uh, in terms of impact, if we, of course, we are still in the ongoing period of the policy. It is difficult to uh, give the impact at this moment, but the policy has definitely paved the way for promoting science technology led innovations and of course attracting private sector contributions into R&D ecosystem. Uh, a specific emphasis has been laid on uh, directing scientific discoveries and outputs of s and activities towards developing priorities in key sectors, key areas, which includes uh, agriculture, manufacturing, water, health, environment and infrastructure. Uh, I'm also happy to mention that uh, the policy has further enhanced participation of India in the global maker science uh, initiatives, which include LIGO, the Large Hydron Collider of uh, Sun, ITER or Square Kilometer Array. Uh, now to, to align with these policies, to implement these policies, uh, each scientific department or R&D institute have carved out its own priorities or programs on development of innovation ecosystems uh, with the sole purpose of applying science to solve the problem, problem of the people, problem of the industry. Uh, all new application oriented programs which, are, which have been developed in the recent past or which are now in the being, in the being, in the development stage. For example, we have a mission on cyber physical system or on e-mobility. Each of these new application-oriented programs essentially keep a component of engaging, involving the industry for industry incubator uh, purposes. A conscious decision or inclusion of involvement of industry is uh, at the forefront in all the programs and initiative by all the government uh, uh, department, ministries, institutions, including the academic institutions. Now, many enabling and catalyzing mechanisms, schemes, and programs 
have been launched by various ministries, departments, institutions to foster innovation and innovation culture. So they, there are multiple uh, mechanisms. Each one of have has its own uh, specific features. For example, some are sectoral, some are referring to only a particular region or a particular need. Some are uh, on a specific sector. Some support the proof of concept, the idea stage, or some take it at a little higher stage. Uh, to put example of some of the uh, most popular uh, programs, uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology has a scheme called National Initiative for developing and harnessing innovations. Now, apart from technology business incubators, they have many more uh, components. Uh, they have accelerators, they have uh, awards for uh, encouraging people to come up with their innovative idea. Then the seed money is given to those ideas as part of one of the incubators. So several schemes are there by the Department of Science and Technology. And uh, when we talk about their technology business incubators, some uh, commitment is also required from the host institute, the one who's setting it up. Part of uh, funding has to go from there. And minimum 30 ventures should be hosted in uh, one technology business incubators. Uh, the support comes up to five years and then it has to go into self-sustainability mode. The other very popular and uh, successful model that we have instituted by the government directly is the Atal Incubation Centers, which support uh, setting up of greenfield incubation centers that nurture innovative startup businesses in their pursuit to become scalable and sustainable enterprises. Here, the grant can be given up to 100%. And the focus is on limited areas, but this area should be aligned with the core strength of the hosting institute. Uh, I'm happy to mention that one of uh, the Atal Incubator Center is uh, set up three years back by one of our institutes uh, located in Hyderabad. It's called CCNB, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. Now, this one focuses only on health research, be it biomedical, pharmaceuticals, uh, and uh, the devices, the analysis, the diagnostics. The Department of Biotechnology, also part of the Ministry of Science and Technology, they have a council called BIRAC. Now, BIRAC supports, uh, again, many initiatives to bring together the industry and academia, but they are focused on, bio, uh, on promoting the biotechnological industry in India. So accordingly, they have uh, frame-based schemes. Then there are a few schemes also by the Ministry of uh, Small and Medium Enterprises, MSME. Uh, they have their own incubation scheme where they give some funding, they give some award, some seed money. And uh, the initiative is to take up from idea to uh, scale up scale. In addition to these ministries uh, initiative, the academic institute, they also have their uh, research parks, the incubators. One very successful example is from the IIT Madras, IIT Madras at Chennai. So they have uh, innovation, the research park, which provides the, uh, the expertise desired by the resident uh, industries and the institute, the faculty, the students, they get the real time problems to work on. So it's a very good mix and a very successful uh, example of uh, research parks in India. It houses about uh, I think uh, many Fortune 1000 companies are also part of this uh, park and they can stay there for up to 20 years uh, lease for collaborative research. I'm sorry to jump in Dr. Bansal, but <laughs> could you please wrap up now? Sure, sure. And one Thank successful you. example, again, I would like to quote from uh, the National Chemical Laboratory of CSIR, mm -hmm. which has a venture center in Pune, which has uh, nurtured many, many over uh, uh, it, it's, it's in operation since 2007. In last three years, if we say, then 350 crore rupees have been received as investment by their incubators. Uh, Five-fold valuation of the resident incubators, startups, uh, is the kind of uh, achievements they have. And if you want to see the, the indicators, whether these policies have been effective, 
So I can only mention that the number of publications, number of patents, commercialization of these patents is on the rise. Uh, number of researchers per institution have increased. Uh, we are ranking better in the world uh, rankings for various S&T and R&D innovation purposes. Uh, that's all. That's all from me. Because it, Thank you, it's too much to mention on India. But, uh, Seven minutes is too small yeah. period. <laughs> we understand uh, that, but <laughs> can't have a three hours of this thing. I understand. So, Thank you anyway, so much. our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Tuang Liang Lim, the Executive Director, National Reno National uh, sorry Research Innovation Enterprise Coordination Office at the National Research Foundation in Singapore. Mr. Lim, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, very, very glad to be able to uh, join this uh, illustrious panel and also to be able to speak to uh, the uh, webinar audience. Um, I'm going to cover over the next, uh, hopefully, seven minutes, a, a quick run through of the innovation journey in Singapore. Uh, obviously, a much smaller country compared to India uh, and uh, uh, with much more uh, limited resources, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Slide, please. Um, for our innovation journey, we've, uh, there are three main elements that uh, we focus on, research, innovation, and enterprise, to ensure that the uh, research efforts uh, would eventually be able to translate uh, into uh, innovative product services, uh, and then to be able to flow into companies as part of the uh, innovation journey. Uh, if you look at this chart, uh, uh, really our significant uh, uh, science and technology uh, investments really started uh, in the 1990s. Uh, but with the inflection point sometime in the 2000s where um, we realized that uh, we needed to uh, put a lot more in terms of uh, scientific investments uh, and we set up uh, a, what we call A-STAR, the Agency for the Science and Technology and Research uh, and uh, also to build up a biomedical uh, capability within Singapore as part of our economic review which occurred uh, sometime around the 2000s. The next uh, big jump uh, was uh, sometime in uh, 2006, where uh, the National Research Foundation was formed. Um, <clears throat> the primary reason was that we wanted to look at uh, how to convert and trend our then ac very academic uh, universities into research institutions. Uh, and as such, the country uh, invested in a much more significant amount of money uh, into the research ecosystem. And since then, uh, we've been generally targeting about 1% of our GDP to be spent uh, and invested uh, into the R&D system uh, in a plan that takes, uh, takes place once every five years. So we typically have a five-year plan and we're in the midst of actually uh, finalizing the next five year for the RIE 2025 cycle. Slide, please. Um, so... If you like, over the past 30 years of investments, uh, this is what we've uh, achieved so far. It's a quick snapshot uh, of some of the sample uh, uh, innovation indices uh, that uh, are publicly accessible. Slide, please. Um, as part of the uh, research uh, uh, ecosystem, we, these are the components, the component uh, participants in the research ecosystem. Um, the uh, all manner of companies from the start the way to uh, large enterprises, both local and international. Uh, and what, in some ways, is the, uh, uh, the engine of that innovation uh, ecosystem is that one, we, uh, we've, um, I think we've grown uh, both local and also attracted the international talent. Um, if you like, I think that uh, we are roughly about a 50-50 mix. 50% 50 of the, uh, the uh, research talent are, are Singaporeans while another half are actually formed by uh, um, uh, overseas, uh, overseas uh, investigators and performers. Um, the second segment is, of course, uh, what we, we see in Singapore, very, very strong government engagements with uh, different industry segments to be able to work with them and listen to uh, their industry needs in terms of technologies and to be able to then create the initiatives and allow the research to match up with the industry. Uh, and, and last but not least is to, through many of the pet platforms, allow the co-innovation and open collaboration to take place, not just between the uh, researchers in Singapore, but also um, selectively open up uh, in areas where we recognize that Singapore may not have substantial strength, but our industry needs uh, new capabilities. And we were able to very happily 
uh, reach out to many different uh, experts all over the, the world uh, and uh, for our companies also to link up with uh, even innovation partners, other companies in the world to be able to bring a, a, a product to market. Uh, slide, please. Um, so we do this in two, two directions. Uh, from left to right, if we look at it from the startups, uh, small, small companies, uh, we want to be able to help them in terms of technology discovery, development, uh, very often collaborative uh, forms of uh, research uh, because they, they just don't have uh, the resources to be able to scale up in terms of equipment or expertise. And then from, uh, from the right uh, to the left is where we work with uh, large companies, uh, multinational companies as well, to really help them to identify uh, areas of scientific interest in which they are able to then bring their technology teams into Singapore, set up R&D labs, and then work very, very closely with our academic partners uh, to be able to continue uh, development into state-of-the-art technologies that will be very relevant to what has been identified by their companies and their, their industry sectors as a whole. Slide. So this slide um, gives really just a, a, a small example of some of the things that we do as initiatives. So on the top half, you do see, uh, again, a summary of the uh, research ecosystems. Um, uh, here, I'll just uh, briefly additionally mention not just the universities, but uh, as I earlier mentioned, ASTAR, where the research institutions are, uh, as well as our academic medical centers uh, that are hosted by our hospitals. Now, um, at the bottom half of the slide, you see some examples, uh, four examples of areas that, of how we work uh, with the research ecosystem to bring that strong partnership with uh, companies. Uh, industry alignment projects really typically provide some level of uh, co-funding uh, where industry brings uh, some money to the table and, uh, and, and government matches, and then we're able to fund a research of a particular interest to companies or industry, industry sectors. Technology consortia are when uh, we recognize that there's um, academic strength in a particular technology area, but these technologies could be undiscovered by some of our uh, ongoing uh, industry players. And we then uh, create consortia in which there's a greater opportunities in which uh, the industry can learn a little bit more about the technologies. And in doing so, uh, create then the, the right environment in which uh, both the academia and the industry can participate and, and strengthen uh, uh, their collaboration. Um, the corporate labs are very, very specific ones in which uh, typically uh, well-established companies then form uh, strategic partnerships with universities where they've, they've identified key areas, key labs uh, in which they were able to join and collaborate uh, in specific areas uh, to meet their industry needs. Uh, and then last but not least, our national innovation challenges, which are larger scale, uh, broad based uh, challenges. Uh, and I'll, I'll have a slide on that later to just show how we're able to allow that open innovation to um, bring both academia and companies together to come up with new ideas to solve new challenges. Slide, please. Uh, this is just an example of the, uh, the consortium. We've got uh, 11 so far. Um, the, the, the nature of the technologies are embedded within uh, the slide. Uh, this slide will be made available to those who request it. Slide, please. Um, we also provide innovation clusters where, uh, in particular, uh, in a particular industry segment or technology area, uh, where we need uh, the collaboration of both the industry, academia, and also uh, government regulatory bodies to be able to come together to, to facilitate the innovation. Slide. Um, I'll skip through this slide. I'll just leave it to the last, uh, one of the last slides. Next, please. Yes, uh, this is the National Innovation Challenge. We've recently launched it uh, in response to, uh, in some ways, the, uh, the, the COVID environment. And the intent is to really allow uh, a fresh look uh, at how companies uh, need to be able to uh, translate or react to the new COVID environment uh, and so um, provide the necessary funding for companies to come together, provide uh, challenge statements and also invite other players to, uh, to collaborate in coming up with solutions that are both uh, participated both by the companies as well as the academia. I'm sorry to jump in, slide. Mr. Lim, but if you could yeah, wrap I, up Yeah, I think now, that's the last, that okay. is my last slide. <laughs> sorry, good timing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lim, for, 
for telling us about how Singapore is going about it. Our next speech, speaker is Dr. Christian Bush, uh, Scientific Advisor and Deputy Head of the Innovation Unit at the State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation in Switzerland. Dr. Bush, over to you. Thank you very much um, for this uh, introduction and for this honorable invitation. Now, I, I've been asked to, to say a, a few words about uh, what, uh, the what is the contribution of the Swiss Confederation to the outstanding position of Switzerland in terms of innovation performance. And the traditional answer from Siri has been, um, well, not much. Um, and the reason was, as um, I, I heard Sebastian Hook saying last week in the webinar, um, or quoting our former state secretary, um, that we used to say, well, we don't even have an innovation policy. Now, I would like to briefly show that's not entirely true. Um, but the intention of that uh, phrase was, of course, to say in, a, in an ironic way that sometimes in, in economic policy, it, it's more important what you don't do than what you're actually doing. So I will show we do have a Swiss uh, innovation policy with a sort of different approach than, than many other countries. But of course, that different approach, that is our innovation policy. So keeping that in mind, I would like to, to give you three um, messages. Um, that's just a, a selection in, given the, the um, time available. So the first message is, well, we don't put much weight on innovation rankings. Now that may be surprising, uh, given that Switzerland is usually uh, seen as the global innovation champion or usually ranks first in, in many uh, innovation rankings. Um, but, you know, to many people that uh, in our house, being number one is actually a dangerous position. Because when you, well, we think we do a lot of things right, but when you start losing that position, you may be pushed to do things that, that actually don't make much sense in your conception of innovation policy. But in addition, focusing on indicators may also be misleading for innovation policy. So there are many aspects in innovation rankings where Switzerland is actually low ranked. Uh, so for instance, um, regarding the uh, public funding of innovation, um, one of the indicators in the uh, innovation scoreboard, for instance. Now, in our view, that's actually not a bad thing because the other side of the coin is that most of the R&D is actually financed by, financed by the private sector. So, so we would argue, well, it's, it's not always clear that a better ranking in these indicators is actually better for innovation in policy. In addition, innovation is actually something that's very hard to grasp. So many indicators, if you look at it more closely, do not actually measure innovation, but you know, some, some aspects that are related to, to uh, innovation, but are more or less uh, an indicator of the framework conditions uh, for econ economic activity and for innovation. So and that, that brings me to my next point. Um, my second message is, well, we try to keep innovation policies as simple as possible. What do I mean? Now, the innovation system has, of course, many aspects uh, that are important uh, for innovation, including education, infrastructure, and for many countries, even, even social policies. Now, in our view, um, these issues should as much as possible be addressed in the sectoral policies. So in the social policy, in the labor market policy and so on, but should not be part of the, of the general or more narrow innovation policy with, with, which has a different objective. Now a similar issue is with the grand challenges such as uh, you know, environmental or climate uh, challenges, which as far as much as possible in Switzerland is not part of, of the general innovation policy. Now, of course, again, innovation is, is, is crucial for these issues to be solved, but where needed and appropriate, this has to be developed within the sectoral policy that ensures that initiatives are, are specifically tailored to, to the demands and needs of, of the sectoral or, or of the individual context. Now, taking things apart in such a way helps to avoid complicated regulations and policies. And, and I think that's one of the factors of Switzerland. We have one of the leanest legislations for, re research, uh, for research and innovation promotion with only about, uh, with a law consisting of about 50 articles. 
<clears throat> so in the same way, my, my third and, and last message would be or also relates to taking into account the limitations of, of, of governments. So my message is, yes, we do have an innovation policy, but with rather strict principles in, in international comparison. Now, what do I mean? What are these principles? Now, first, on a macro level, we, we try to not do industrial policies. So that means we don't define technologies or strategic sectors to be pushed by the government. And the reason is simple. We, 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 are believe, we, or we believe that the government is not very good at picking winners or uh, at choosing technologies. Maybe we can talk about that in the discussion later on. Um, the second, the second uh, principle is, is, is one of technology neutrality. Now, when dealing with new technologies, uh, we believe it's often a good approach to avoid the technology as such, but to treat the outcomes um, of the technology. So we, you should try in the, in the regulation to treat comparable activities and risks in an equal manner. <clears throat> Finally, I, I would just briefly like to, to, to illustrate how these principles are implemented in our innovation policy or in the more narrow innovation policy um, and in our innovation promotion agencies. Now, first, again, our structure in, in Switzerland is rather simple. So at the national level, we basically finance only three types of institutions, uh, or at least directly. And among, among these institutions, um, I think we, we, we're going to hear more about that. Uh, the Central Innovation Support I Agency, InnoSwiss, is, is uh, of course in, in the focus. This is where by far the largest share of our money on, on innovation support uh, is spent at the national level. And for InnoSwiss, um, matching these principles at the macroeconomic level, um, the most important principles we try to follow uh, is First, a strong focus on science-based innovation. So the bulk of their budget is, uh, goes into science-based R&D projects. Now, the unique thing is they have to be developed by firms together with an academic partner. So this uh, tandem is, is, is something that's uh, one, of, one of the strong principles. Now, second, the public funding exclusively goes to the university or research partner of the project. So firms in, in Switzerland actually do not receive uh, public money in, in innovation funding. And third, uh, the bottom-up principle, of course, that matches the idea that we should not define technologies from, from the government uh, point of view. Um, but projects are funded bottom-up. So topics are not predefined by the government or by InnoSwiss, but must be submitted on, on individual initiative. And then funding is allocated by experts on a, on a competitive basis. Now, these principles, we believe, limit public interference with, with, with the markets and, and ensure that innovation, there's also a strong self-interest by firms to, to, um, uh, uh, to follow these innovation uh, projects. So um, let, me, let me briefly conclude, well, different from what you may have heard in, in, uh, before from Switzerland, well, we do have an innovation policy. But the point is the role of the Confederation is, is rather limited and, and subsidiary. However, we, we also strongly believe that it, and in, in our context, these um, strict principles are, are not a burden, but contribute to, to the uh, good position of, of Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bush. And our final panelist for this uh, morning afternoon is Mr. Michael Hill, the founder and CEO of DPB Group Switzerland, but he wears many other hats, including also being associated with the Swiss Innovation Agency InnoSwiss that Dr. Bush referred to. So, Mr. Hill, over to you. Thanks, Lux. Also, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I'm very happy to be here and, and talking with you and, and, and to you. It's been very interesting to me to hear, I think, the different approaches, you know, in India, Singapore and Switzerland. And what I'm trying to do in the next um, seven minutes as well, it's sharing a couple of personal observations uh, on, on these policies. Um, and this has very much based a little bit on, on my perspectives I've had on innovation culture and on my various hats I'm wearing. So as I said before, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, I have my own company. Uh, that's one perspective of innovation I have. 
Secondly, I'm, I'm sitting in a couple of boards of companies and foundations, all of them as well, you know, innovation is very important to them. And, you know, we also have to decide on what kind of policies and what kind of projects we run on innovation. Then thirdly, I'm also kind of teaching at universities and I've been teaching entrepreneurship for, you know, 14 years. Um, here I'm more kind of the observer and, and try to better understand, you know, these ecosystems. And then finally, as just mentioned before, I'm also kind of an expert of industry. So I'm one of the guys who looks at these projects which are, which are being submitted by companies and uh, academic institutions and try to assess whether they're worthwhile being, being supported. Now, when I was given the topic uh, of, of, uh, of today, I couldn't resist you know, um, looking for a theory or at least a framework helping uh, to answer the question. And I ended up with um, institutional theory by Scott, you know, he's an organizational theorist and he tried to find out how the organizations, be it universities, be it companies, even be it government bodies, how do they behave? Um, and he found kind of three main forces, you know, or uh, drivers of, of behavior. One, yes, it's regulation. So what are the rules? What are kind of um, sanctions, but also kind of incentives? Um, secondly, you know, social obligations, norms. So what is considered to be good, to be valuable. And finally, he said, you know, what's probably the strongest pillar in his view are the cultural cognitive forces. So meaning, so what are shared beliefs among people or organizations in an industry? And, and just using this very simple kind of approach, I just tried to formulate five hypotheses on my observation, what I believe, you know, has an influence on innovation culture. I think, first of all, I strongly believe that, you know, the strongest, strongest force as well in innovation culture, it's the cultural cognitive force. So, you know, when people believe that innovation is positive, that you have to have an open culture, uh, you should, you know, collaborate uh, with other companies, with universities, um, with the state on innovation. That's, in my view, definitely the strongest uh, force. And in my view as well, should be the ultimate goal of any measure you know, taken by government and by company, companies. Secondly, um, I also believe that you know, the optimal mix of measures you know, by, by state, for instance, you know, whether they put more on the regulatory side or more kind of on the normative side, in my view depends very much on the political, social and um, administrative culture of the respective context. And I think we've seen it very nicely this morning, you know, um, when we heard the Singapore approach, Indian approach and Swiss approach, which were very different uh, in, in, you know, what I put the emphasis on. I think all of them are very effective uh, as, as the rankings show, but they're very different. And, uh, you know, just going back to, to Christian, what before about the Swiss approach, yes, in Switzerland, it's not a, a top-down plan-driven um, system or economy or a society. So I think you need to have a, a different set of measures to really drive this uh, innovation culture, whereas other you know, markets and countries um, have a very different approach on, on driving policies and driving strategies. And therefore, I think it needs to be fit with the respective uh, context. Probably my, my third observation uh, relates to you know, regulatory measures you can take. For instance, you know, um, influencing tax codes or, or giving that out subsidi uh, subsidies to companies or institutions. Um, my experience has been that this actually can be quite complex <laughs> as you know, you always kind of interfere with a, an overall system and you probably want to drive innovation, but there are always side effects. And some of them might be intended, some of them not. And I think therefore my observation has been this can be quite tricky, but definitely can be part of, of the mix. When it comes to normative measures, you know, such as, for instance, driving campaigns, competition, contests, or just, you know, motivating companies to collaborate um, together or with, with the state, I found this actually very effective uh, in my experience. Um, and we have all seen this morning, you know, what uh, Singapore is doing in Switzerland and India. That's, I think, a big part of any innovation policy. And I would say, even though the effects might not be long term in every single project, but I think it can really have a positive implication on, on changing the culture uh, in, in a context. And then finally, I think, you know, really trying to change attitude toward risk, change attitude toward education, business and research. Yes, that's probably the, the most effective one in the long term. 
but I think it takes a long, long time. I think it's probably very difficult for government on its own to try, uh, try to drive those changes. But I think it definitely can be achieved, you know, if you are opening up, if you try to onboard business, if you try to onboard, you know, education and different parts of society, I think then in my view, this can be a very, very effective measure. So this just a very brief kind of, you know, a couple of personal observations uh, on innovation culture, looking, you know, at, at different uh, of my experience and exposure and now very much look forward uh, to discussing some of the hypotheses and, you know, what you said before in a discussion. Thank you, Mr. Hill, for your presentation. Uh, I now call upon Mr. Sebastian Hook, the CEO of Swissnext India and Consul General of Switzerland, uh, in Bangalore, to address this discussion with our panelists. Sebastian, over to you. Thank you so much, Indranil, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to all the eminent speakers for their uh, very precious uh, insights. Uh, highly interesting to see the, the differences uh, and some of the commonalities between the different ecosystems. Let me start the, the, the other way around with, with the last speaker and going back with, with, with Michael. I think you said uh, quite a few uh, interesting things. Um, you have been on, the, on both uh, sides of the of the aisle being entrepreneur, but also sort of studying from academic point of view, but then also like on the, uh, uh, on the government side. Um, and, and you just mentioned about those uh, sort of sh short term impact measures, such as awards, certifications, the kind of measures that, that um, you know, the different innovation agencies can offer. Um, and, and, and I believe in Switzerland over the last maybe 15 years, we have seen really a, a huge increase of those kind of, of programs. Um, a lot of support for startups where 20 years ago there was there was none, almost or very few. And in the last, especially five, six, seven years, also the cantons have really uh, uh, come with, with such programs. It's been really mushrooming of startup support. Uh, and you mentioned how startups or companies in general, you know, change their behavior according to the, the culture, the institutions. So I'm, I'm wondering a little bit, uh, is there such thing as having too much uh, startup support? Uh, where basically startups uh, sort of jump from one uh, award ceremony to another uh, instead of focusing on, on, on markets? Is, is there like sort of a, a limit as to how much support we can provide to startups? I think it's a very good question. I think if you ask me, you know, just looking at the facts and figures, I would agree with you. Yes, that probably it's too much support, you know, for early, early uh, stage startups, you know, kind of just getting people, uh, uh, you know, involved in that. I think there's a lot of there around. There might be a little bit too little at the later stage. That's probably not, not optimally um, calibrated, the support. But on the other hand, I would say, again, I think it's still a good thing because, as I said, I think, in my view, the main effects of those, you know, fundings, uh, startup events and certification, it's not, as, not just funding these particular startups, but it's really, I think, changing the culture and changing the attitudes toward entrepreneurship, you know, making sure people, in particular young people, do it something which, you know, should be an ambition and aspiration. And I think, therefore, I think it's well invested money. <laughs> uh, if you kind of, if this leads to a change of attitude and, and, you know, people really kind of see it as a positive thing and, and not, not just the risks of, of being an entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, maybe moving to, uh, to Christian and, and good to see you uh, again since we met in Switzerland. Um, you, you said two, three really interesting things. Um, that I don't necessarily agree with, so, so I'm going to pick on that. Um, and, and you said one thing about rankings, that we don't look at innovation rankings. And, and maybe just more as a comment, that I, in a way, I think I might want to contest that. So maybe as public servants, that is not uh, important to you. But I think for politicians, uh, if Switzerland was to fall from, you know, number one to number five, eight, or, uh, you know, even uh, out of the top ten, wouldn't that create some pressure to then uh, intervene on a, on a, on a government le level? So just more as a, as a comment, maybe you can uh, give your view on that. Uh, my, my other question I had is actually that we were speaking about the investments by the private sector 
um, in total spending 3.5% uh, on R&D of the GDP as a, as a total two third or more than two third from the private sector. But when we look more uh, in detail, actually, it is mostly the, the big companies, the, the, the Roche and Novartis and Nestle's, which, which are really investing a lot in, into R&D. If you look at the SMEs, um, I believe that the, the, some reports would say that actually they are investing less into, into innovations. Maybe again, a bit of a provocative question: Is, is Switzerland really as innovative uh, in the long term as uh, as as we as rankings show? Thank you, Sebastian. That's uh, very very uh, very good questions, and I like uh, some fantastic questions. Um, now, with regard to R and D uh, spending, that that's of course uh, a very difficult uh, issue. Yes, I mean, of course, you're right. Most of the increase has been driven by, by a few large companies in, in, the, in the past year and by, uh, by the pharmaceutical sector. Um, but that's, that's also something you see on the global level. That's not, so, not only in, in Switzerland. Um, we, we're, we're currently uh, looking at that in detail at the developments across uh, you know, different uh, firms, different sectors and so on. Um, it's it, it's very hard to to say what what the development in in the details have been because the data in Switzerland is not so so good in in, in this regard. So it's really an issue at at the moment. But I mean, uh, looking at the overall picture, um, I, I think not. Uh, well, it's it's hard to say Switzerland is a, is in a bad situation because you can find also many success, successful SMEs and many successful uh, sectors uh, besides the pharmaceutical sector. So you, you really have to have to be, be a bit careful in this regard. But, um, you know, sort of linking to your first question, uh, the issue again is, should you base your policy on this ranking or on this indicator? And that is actually a bit more a difficult question. Now, it's, it's a huge debate on the international level, for instance, in the European Union about reaching the share of uh, R&D spending on GDP. And my impression is that um, countries seem to be a bit more um, careful in, in, in this uh, with such a goal. So there has been a, a project at the OECD where I'm in, in, a, in the innovation um, uh, a committee where I'm a delegate, and, and many countries have sort of confirmed that it uh, it's uh, it's not so easy to reach R&D spending as a percent of GDP, and there's there's also a shift. You know, many academic uh, um, present uh, presenters saying, well, you should be really careful. Uh, R&D spending isn't such a good indicator for for uh, innovation policy. So I think that links a bit to your, to your first question. I haven't said uh, that indicators are not important to us. Of course, it's very important for political communication and it's very important to see the details. So sometimes um, you can really you know, improve your policy if you look at, at detailed uh, indicators, but the overall rankings are more or less, well, the, the main use is for political communication, not for really improving uh, uh, policy. So what I was saying is we don't base our policy on, on such indicators because in some ways it would be easy to, to reach a better position, but it doesn't always make sense. So as I said, the, 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 the funding of, of innovation by, by the government, there are a lot of other indicators. You know, uh, you can find um, indicators on, on protection of, uh, of investors on uh, um, things like uh, closing businesses or, or opening startups and so on. And there's always, you know, if you really look at the details in all the indicators, it, it's very difficult to really show how to improve things and if it's always better to improve things. So that, that, was my, that was my argument. But of course, I mean, everybody likes to be number one in these, in the, in these indicators. And I'm sure once we lose that position, there will be strong uh, political pressure to, to do better. 
Thank you, thank you Christian. Maybe a question to, um, to Dr. Bansal and Mr. Lim, uh, and, and again, picking up on, on what uh, Christian has, has said. Uh, another thing he said, um, and, and he, he has nicely described and illustrated the, the Swiss approach, which, which uh, appears quite different than what we see in India or, or what we see in Singapore. And he said that, that the government is not good at picking winners. Uh, now, maybe my, my provocative question to you, are, are you picking winners? Uh, maybe Dr. Swami. In our schemes, it's not the government, uh, uh, it's not the government directly which is picking the winners. Uh, the schemes which are being operated by the government, uh, they are being managed by the organizations like CSIR, for example. So I was looking at our venture center, which is in Pune. They are operating many of the schemes for the, on behalf of the government of India. So it is the scientists who have a business bent of mind and the accordingly formulated committee which will take such decisions. So it's not the government directly who is uh, doing this. But when it comes to selecting the technology business incubators, for example, then of course it is the government. But individual project is not under the control of the government. And, and, and would you, what, what would you say about the amount of support? Is, is there such thing as having too much support for startups or for innovation? He, he, here in Bangalore, one thing that uh, um, one entrepreneur told me when, when I arrived uh, in the very beginning, he said that there are more incubators in Bangalore than startups, um, which, which is, of course, an exaggeration. But um, how, how, do you see, how do you look at that? Uh, I won't say that it is uh, more incubators and startup looking at the scale and the population of the country. We need to have them more actually. And uh, these startups or the, uh, the facilitating uh, instrument, they should work more like a delivery makers. So we have, it is good to have good R&D, good technology, but the ultimate goal is to reach the market. So that has to be done through a delivery uh, makers. So I think I would not agree uh, to the statement that we have more uh, startups and incubators. We need to have more. And, and each one of us is trying to develop more and uh, with, with unique features and with our own understanding to take things to the market and of course for the benefit of people. Thank you, Dr. Swami. Mr. Mr. Lim, how, how do you look at the role of government and, and the, 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 the level of... Yeah. Thanks, Sebastian. I, I think that uh, for uh, the Singapore government, it is true that we do not pick the winners. Um, and actually the way that we uh, operationalize this is that a lot of the uh, proposals uh, would require uh, particular companies or industries to be able to contribute, meaning that they, they would have to put in their uh, cash or in-kind contributions. And that typically is a very good indicator that, that uh, the particular area of the proposal would have a stronger line of sight to success. And that's how we are actually able to do that. Now, having said that, there are other areas in which we potentially see that there may be market failure, that industry may not be able to organize itself very well. Uh, and our economic agencies, uh, depending on their sector analysis, may see that uh, there is a need to provide some level of catalytic action to enable and encourage uh, industries to, to form new relationships uh, case in point uh, is, the, is the built environment or the construction industry in which actually um, a, a lot of the, uh, the, the value is extracted by the big developers. And then the, the, at the bottom half in terms of uh, the construction companies and, and contractors, they're all very, very fragmented, very, very competitive and in, in some ways very commoditized. Yet if we were to increase and want to increase the innovation levels uh, to increase the levels of inno uh, uh, innovation in terms of design, in terms of the use of construction materials, in terms of the use of uh, automation uh, in the construction sites, uh, and so on and so forth. Actually, you need to be able to organize the sector to collaborate and, and be able to then uh, uh, allow some of the value to be translated downwards so that then the, the return on investment, if you like, from a particular research and investment can be spread out and, um, and uh, distributed uh, correctly. And in doing so, you encourage the innovation of a sector that previously uh, is not innovative at all because of market structures. I think that's so that in some ways it's a blend of both and it really depends on different sectors as well. Uh, and uh, I think uh, for in Singapore, the, the um, uh, economic agencies pay, pay close attention to which ones 
they think that may require a little bit more of government intervention. Uh, which leads to, to my second point and to the point which you, you uh, mentioned about whether there's too much money. And um, I, I, we agree that actually there will be times when you do need to put in money to catalyze certain things. And for example, uh, the startup scene in Singapore wasn't very vibrant about 10 years ago. And we needed to really uh, invest and uh, put in what we call easier money, all right, for these, to, to encourage the startup investments uh, and, and uh, the VCs to come to Singapore and look at the startup scenes. And in doing so, really get the car out of first gear into the second gear. And so what we've seen more recently is that that approach has allowed uh, a lot of startups, particularly in the digital space, right, to flourish. Uh, and once we've observed that, we're now switching gears and we're now directing our funds towards uh, more of the uh, more advanced, more what we call deep tech because we see that there's no longer a need for government intervention in the digital space. So we, while we, we provide that, we, are, we need to be able to tailor the, uh, and, uh, tailor the government response in accordance to what's, what the market is actually reacting to. Uh, and and maybe, maybe to the last, uh, maybe one more point to add uh, is to the point which you raised about rankings. We, we agree that uh, we do not chase the absolute figures in terms of the rankings. Uh, but being able to monitor the uh, indices and understand the uh, individual components of it helps to inform, particularly for Singapore as a young, growing country in the innovation space, which are the areas that we may have to pay a little bit more attention to. And also broadly, in getting into a, at least a, a certain upper band in the, uh, in the global rankings, uh, helps the search function by companies thinking about R&D to say that, okay, at least Singapore is a destination that they can think about. Uh, it also allows uh, research talent, which we want to attract, to think about Singapore and says, hey, you know, the, the Singapore as an R&D destination has a certain level of credibility. Let's take a closer look. I think it's just uh, basically opening a few doors for us. But of course, in terms of the actual uh, details, the companies, the researchers, they have to do their own due diligence to decide whether to come to Singapore or not. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and maybe just to, to, to wrap up, maybe the same question to Dr. Swami again about the rankings. How, how do rankings inform Indian policy making? Um, I'm just thinking India being such a huge count, uh, country, if, if you look at, at you know, Bangalore and compared with other cities, um, you know, can you look at India as, as one country which can be sort of summarized in, in, in one figure? Uh, you're on mute, ma'am. As you understand, the task is not uh, that easy. Um, at the central level, the policies are made. Uh, one big change has been uh, done by this government is that uh, the planning commission that has been converted into uh, Niti Ayog. Niti Ayog is uh, liaising not only for the center, but also integrating the state level uh, activities also which includes the innovation as well. So now the innovation policies are also taking care of the state level policies. There are national uh, commissions and there are policies. There are many, many uh, structure. It's very complicated uh, innovation structure in India. But I think uh, it's working. It's slow. Uh, we started talking about innovation only about 10 years back. So we had some schemes, some policies, but uh, we are in the right direction, I think. Thank you so much. And I think with that, I'll have, uh, I mean, I have many more questions, but I think we'll move on now to, to the uh, questions of the audience. Uh, Sebastian, uh, before we move on, I think uh, Christian had a comment to make. <laughs> Sorry for my intervention. I did not find the raise your hand function here. No, it's, there's of course, there will be a lot to say. Um, just one brief uh, remark. So uh, of course, I, I, I was a bit provocative on my uh, introduction. Now, just one example, of course, I mean, it's not about selecting individual firms when I said, talked about picking winner, but just a very recent example. We've been working a lot on, on artificial intelligence in the, in the past two years. And that's a good example for how Swiss innovation policy works. So uh, I think it's uh, artificial intelligence is a topic where many countries feel or have the uh, impression that they should in have additional investment in order to, to remain competitive. But when we looked at it, 
um, we realized that all of the actors in the Swiss innovation and research system had taken up the issue long before the government even started thinking about it. So it was, a, was actually a good test for, uh, for our system to, show, to see if it works. But what I was trying to say is that sort of, sort of when, when technologies come to the government, especially in Bern where people are, you know, scientifically proved to be the slowest people in the world, uh, then in Switzerland, we would definitely be too late for, for any additional investment. So that was, that, that's maybe an, an explanation for, for my, my provocative point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. And, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that uh, scientific study on, on the, you know, people being slow in burn. So, <laughs> um, but let, let's move on. I, I think, uh, Indrina, I can hand over directly to Laurence for the Q&A from the audience. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm just going to take the few questions from the audience. Actually, we don't have that many questions, but uh, maybe I will just going to take the first one for from Abernergy in Frankfurt. Um, so the question is, how can countries lead in scaling and diverging regional global innovation efforts? And how do you perceive the sustainability goals and new areas like space research? So that's a bit more maybe specific. Um, I don't know who would like to start uh, answering, maybe Dr. Brahma? Uh, see, when you say space, if we look at what India has been able to achieve, mm -hmm. ISRO has a very good uh, Indian space research organization. They have uh, a very good model. Uh, as if we say innovation, they have uh, a separate company. They have set up a separate company, which takes care of applications of uh, various space-related technologies. They have set up their own university the, into academics. So they are developing their own expertise. So required for the field of space, I think. Uh, so various models are being uh, used in India. But, uh, very specific, I cannot uh, answer this question. All right, uh, Mr. Lim, maybe like I know that there is some space uh, research, um, you know, research on in space technologies uh, in different um, institutions here in Singapore. And I don't know exactly if there is any kind of uh, link with uh, industries and startups. Maybe you want to tell more about this? Yes, uh, thank you, Laurent. Um, Singapore, we don't have a space agency. So in terms of the, the scale and ambition, it's a, a lot smaller. But we do have an office of uh, science and technology for uh, space uh, as well as industry. Uh, and that one is actually uh, um, cited within the Economic Development Board or EDB. Um, and um, they have in some ways been also uh, funding uh, very nascent space related research, primarily in terms of uh, payloads and in some areas also in uh, space propulsion uh, as, a, as a start. Um, Singapore also has uh, the, the, the Space uh, Technology Association that actually links up with a lot of the regional partners. Uh, um, started by a very enthusiastic individual, non-government, uh, but then I think that the, his, uh, the, the, the grouping has gained quite a bit of an attraction in which uh, um, space experts, both industry and researchers, uh, come often to, uh, to Singapore just to uh, have a, a similar a rounds of uh, exchange and interaction. Uh, I think that we are uh, in a, still in the early stages, uh, but as we are moving to the next phase of uh, research and development, some of the uh, remote surveillance aspects uh, of space, I think the question will also link to space and sustainability uh, in terms of actually looking at uh, using space, uh, space observation, uh, looking at climate change and, and, and monitoring the, the impact is of a, um, it, also of great interest to Singapore. Uh, you know, Singapore being an island and we are really deeply concerned about, uh, apart from all other issues about sea level rises. Uh, and we are, uh, as a country, looking at how we will need to look at not just, uh, 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 not just about uh, the, uh, the climate change, but also about climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Um, recognizing that there are some things that are now possibly inevitable and we need to think about new scientific solutions 
to be able to address the future for uh, for Singapore as an island. Thank you. Yeah, I actually, like, I just wanted to mention that as well. Like, so we have, uh, you, like, actually, it was one, I guess, of the strategies from, of Singapore uh, to attract talent. So you had these excellent centers like the ETH Center in Singapore, and they are working, they've been working, uh, they just celebrated the 10-year anniversary in August, and they've been working on a project calling Singapore um, for quite a long time. And so do you think, like, uh, you know, this is really bringing... Uh, some benefit and sort of, um, you know, like uh, technologies that Singapore could use and as well export uh, maybe as a result of collaboration between, you know, Singapore and Switzerland. Yes, uh, thank you, Lauren, for raising that up. I think that uh, for the benefit of the, uh, the, the webinar, uh, we, the ETH uh, have been collaborating with uh, Singapore and Singapore universities and uh, recently completed a study called Cooling Singapore which uh, concluded that uh, if we were able to redesign uh, our urban landscape, uh, looking at new materials, new designs, new to be able to then to think about the airflows and all that, there would be potential to be able to try to reduce uh, the, the temperature uh, by as much as four degrees, uh, depending on the design. And, and that study was independently uh, developed uh, but raised to the attention of uh, the Singapore government uh, in conclusion. And with that, then the, we were then much more informed uh, and our national development agencies have now uh, set up, listened, understood the science and are now then working with the, the scientists to think about the next uh, aspect in which we're now try, trying to translate these studies into areas of uh, potential implementation and new discoveries. So uh, again, matching up to what I mentioned about climate mitigation uh, as an important thrust for Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lim. Um, so I'm just going to take another question from the audience from Anil Chandy. Um, uh, do you see potential for collaboration among countries uh, for focus areas in national innovation policies? Are there any such example that you would highlight or is it always a national agenda? So maybe, I don't know, maybe Christian, Dr. Christian Bush, um, could you address this question? In Switzerland, do we see any sort of collaboration as, um, or is it always like a more national agenda? Sorry, I didn't get, get, get the whole question. So that's related to uh, so to SDGs or, or in general? No, so it's more like, uh, so we, if we talk about innovation policies, uh, is it really uh, taken just as a national agenda? So meaning, do we incorporate collaboration with other countries in the uh, innovation policy? Or um, is there any examples that you could highlight? Or I don't know, in Switzerland? Or is this just a very much uh, national agenda? Well, it depends. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very good question. And I think uh, things are, are, are changing uh, in this respect. Now, um, for, first, let me remind, I mean, innovation is, uh, many people still think innovation is, is, is um, something that's related to national competitiveness. But that's actually a misleading picture. I mean, innovation is by large a global public good. I mean, if countries innovate in the long run, this will, this will benefit uh, societies all over the world. But of course, I mean, this has to be, it's not an automatic thing. I mean, this, is, this has to be accompanied by, by a number of, of, of policies to, to ensure that. So um, now we really see, I mean, traditionally, of course, um, in Switzerland, it's been um, in the autonomy of the actors to to uh, to follow inter international policy uh, strategies. So that has been that has been done um, quite in, uh, quite uh, working quite well. Now I think we we now see um, a, a discussion about you know addressing the the grand uh, challenges, and I think there is clearly um, a need to, to better address that on the, on the international level. So um, looking at COVID, COVID measures, um, I think we, we really need to, to look at what kind of corporations have worked well, how, how could we in, in the future 
um, address such things on the international level better uh, by minimizing uh, the uh, money that's that's been spent in a bad way. So I think um, uh, many many issues will remain on on the national level, but we we really need to sort out what what kind of things need to be or, need, or when cooperation needs needs to be improved. All right, thank you. Um, and I have another question from. Uh, I.J. Rahman, who is um, asking like a very short question. Um, we are talking a lot about innovation and research rather than focusing on improving efficiencies of enterprises. Um, so I'm not sure uh, who would like to answer this one. Probably I can, um, I can take it on. And probably just going back to the formal question, just come back here. I fully support Trishan's call, I think, for more collaboration between countries. I mean, my borrow concepts from corporate strategy, which is called the competition model, that you are, you know, competing and collaborating at the same time as companies. And I think the same as well, in my view, from business perspective, should apply to states, to so governments. You know, they should try to see, are there kind of joint efforts they could take to, to drive innovation? And in my view, that would yield great, great outcomes, not only for the companies involved, universities involved, but as well for the respective government. I think here, I, from a business perspective, wearing a business hat, I also would really like to see much, much more collaboration between countries in innovation policies. Now, to, uh, to, to the other question, um, as you know, what, what should be the, the goal of innovation policies? Um, I, I, I very much think that you know, companies usually know best how to can really drive efficiency, effectiveness within the boundaries of co corporations. You know, that's what they're doing all day long. That's their core <laughs> business and, and competence. And I, I don't think so that you know, there will be much value add in, in government stepping in and, in, and you know, proposing policies, uh, you know, trying to help solve micro problems within companies. Um, I think what governments can do and should do it's definitely supporting you know, policies and, and programs which help to drive basic innovations and, and technologies which and companies can adapt. But I think in my view there's quite a, an important line to be drawn between how far it should go and you know, where companies should take on responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you very much uh, for this insight. Um, is anyone would like to add something to, to Michael's comment? Um, I think we, so I think we, we're done with the Q&A questions then. Um, uh, um, I don't know, maybe Sebastian would like to, um, to wrap up um, the session. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Laurence. And, and uh, yes, it's up to me to, to wrap up maybe a, a few last uh, words. Uh, for a, a big thank you again to, to all the eminent speakers for, for taking the time and sharing their knowledge and insights uh, with us, with the audience over uh, over three countries uh, and maybe even more. So thank you so much for, for giving us uh, and sharing that knowledge. Um, I, I, th I think some of the, the, the key takeaways for me, uh, I mean, nothing overly surprising, but, but I think obviously innovation is on top of the agenda everywhere with, with similar concepts, the, the relationship between universities and the corporate sector, the, the flow of knowledge be between them and, um, and also the need to address uh, you know, big challenges with, with uh, investments into, into R&D. Uh, however, I think we did see that, that there are different approaches to that. I would say like a, maybe a, uh, in a more generic way, maybe a Asian approach where I think the state does play uh, um, a different role than in, back in Switzerland. At the same time, I think we could shed light a little bit um, be behind that notion. I, th I think it's, it's more complex uh, than, than that. It can't be summarized uh, in, in, in a simple uh, sentence. Um, and, and I think especially when we look at, um, you know, topics such as uh, ran rankings, and maybe we should do another webinar just on innovation rankings and science rankings. Um, again, we can see that, that they, they, they play a, a role, but maybe in, in different ways. They, they inform policy uh, makers, uh, but again, not just a single number, but really more, uh, you know, the, the, the information, the data, which is behind those, those, uh, those ranking numbers. Um, and, and I really like those Michael's uh, slides on, on the culture of innovation, what, what we mean by that actually, the different notions. Um, and, and we see that support is necessary uh, 
but it depends maybe on on what kind of uh, stage we are of the of the ecosystem and and the, the specific sector. Um, so uh, again, a, a big uh, a big thank you to to all the speakers. Also, a big thank you to the uh, Embassy of Switzerland in Singapore for uh, uh, partnering up with us for this uh, for this event. Uh, big thank you to Indra Neil for for organizing that, and and to all the audience to to uh, for participating and for asking such uh, engaging questions. Um, so with that, uh, I wish everyone a very good week, uh, and I think maybe the last word to Indra Neil. Yeah, and uh, thank you all and hope to see you again next Tuesday, same time, same place for the, for the final webinar of this series. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. Very nice meeting all of you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. And thank you again. Thank you. Okay.